The American Wild West was a period in American history when the western part of North America was being colonized. And as the name suggests, the Wild West was wild. The western territories had lots of lawlessness, including, of course, outlaws, gunfights, and robberies of all kinds. In this list today, we will be going over the top five outlaws of the Wild West period. And I will let you guys decide if the Wild West outlaws were folklore heroes or cold-blooded killers. Number five on our list is Billy the Kid. Unlike some of the other outlaws on this list, Billy the Kid never held up a bank, a train, or even a stagecoach. The young gunslinger stole the occasional horse, rustled cattle, and was an escape artist. Billy the Kid was orphaned at the age of 14 and placed in foster homes in New Mexico. Before long, he fell in with a rough crowd and turned to crime. Billy's first arrest came from stealing clothing from a Chinese laundry. He escaped the jailhouse by climbing up the chimney and fled town. Billy the Kid joined up with a gang known for stealing horses, then earned his reputation as a gunslinger when he participated in a bloody frontier business rivalry. Two different sides were fighting over the monopoly of the dry goods and cattle business. The Kid and several other gunsmen were hired to protect an Englishman's property. The next several months, a large shootout happened between the two sides. During this conflict, he killed the sheriff of the town, and he spent life on the run from the authorities because of this. Another sheriff then tracked the kid to a cabin and forced his surrender. The kid was found guilty of the murder of a sheriff and was scheduled for a date with the hangman. But before that happened, he managed to slip out of his handcuffs on the way to the outhouse. He then ambushed a guard, stole his gun, ambushed a second guard, then got control of the courthouse and collected a small arsenal of weapons before fleeing town on a stolen horse. Billy spent several months hiding out but didn't keep a low profile and was found by the authorities yet again. The sheriff who found him fired a shot into his heart which knocked him out at the age of 21. However, some people believe he once again escaped and lived the rest of his life under a different name doing Wild West shows. In his life, Billy's, shall we say, count was at least nine men. Number four is Butch Cassidy. Butch Cassidy is known as one of the most famous outlaws in American history. Butch Cassidy was born into a Mormon family who farmed and raised cattle in Utah. Butch Cassidy grew up very poor as one of 13 children in his family. At age 13, he had his first run-in with the law after being accused of stealing a pair of overalls from a store. As the story goes, Butch Cassidy went into town only to find the store closed. He let himself into the store, took the overalls, and penned a note promising to return with payment. He was arrested over this, and even though he wasn't punished, the experience probably left him feeling resentful towards the authorities. Butch Cassidy learned cattle wrestling and horse training and gunslinging from an older outlaw he likely meant working on a nearby ranch. Butch Cassidy then teamed up with a group of outlaws that would later be known as the Wild Bunch. The Wild Bunch first started out as cattle wrestlers and horse thieves, but they soon turned to robbing banks and trains. The Wild Bunch scoped out the areas that they were going to rob ahead of time and even stashed supplies and extra horses along their intended escape route. Butch Cassidy had teamed up with another outlaw, LZ Lay, and together they robbed several trains and banks and rustled both horses and cattle. When LZ Lay was imprisoned, Butch Cassidy then teamed up with the Sundance Kid. At this point, the authorities were hot on the trail of the Wild Bunch Gang, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid escaped New York, and then traveled to South America, where they owned and ran a ranch in Argentina for a little bit, but then soon returned to an outlaw lifestyle. Drifting from country to country, they robbed banks, trains, and mining stations. The details of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid's deaths remain a mystery even to this day. And there are multiple different stories about their fates. The first is that the two bandits were trapped by a group of mounted soldiers in Bolivia, and both ended up dead. The second story says that both bandits were killed during a bank robbery in Uruguay. And the third and final tale have Cassidy either alone or with Sundance Kid returning to the United States and drifting about under different aliases. 
Butch Cassidy wasn't known for being super violent, and when not committing crimes, Butch Cassidy was actually considered a friendly and helpful guy. It is believed that Butch Cassidy never killed anyone. If only that trend could be followed for everyone on this list. Which brings us to number three, John Wesley Hardin. John Wesley Hardin was a ruthless outlaw who was one of the most notorious. John Wesley Hardin was born in Texas to a Methodist preacher and was named after John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist branch. His parents had high hopes that he would also be a preacher. But what his parents got was the exact opposite. John showed his violent side early in life. When he was a schoolboy, he stabbed a classmate nearly to death in a fight that involved a girl. John Wesley Hardin was known as possibly the quickest drawer and shooter. Part of his secret was how he carried his guns. People at the time carried their pistols at the waist, but Hardin used shoulder holsters instead. The shoulder holster design is credited to Hardin, and this design is still used today. Hardin is also known for killing a man who was snoring too loudly in the next room. Hardin was finally caught and brought to trial. Hardin had killed many people, but was only tried for killing a deputy sheriff, and so was only sentenced with 25 years. Hardin had attempted to escape prison several times, but never succeeded. Even though Hardin was sentenced to 25 years, he only served 15 years and was released early for good behavior. He then went on to become a lawyer living in El Paso, but never gave up carrying his guns around. When the town of El Paso passed an ordinance prohibiting the carrying of firearms in the city, Hardin threatened the constable. The constable later found Hardin playing dice in a saloon, and the constable shot Hardin in the back of the head. By the time Hardin reached his 21st birthday, it is believed that his count was 27, and the lifetime count may have been as high as 44, but this total count is unclear. But according to John Wesley Hardin, they all deserved it. Taking our number two spot is Jesse and Frank James. Jesse James was the son of a Baptist minister. Jesse had a brother, Frank, who would later become his future partner in crime. Jesse's father died when he was very young, and Jesse's mother soon remarried, and then remarried a third time. Perhaps it was the unstable family life that led both Jesse and Frank to a life of violence and crime. Jesse's older brother, Frank, joined a ruthlessly violent gang of guerrillas known as the Bushwhackers, and Jesse followed him several years later. The Bushwhackers carried out attacks against Union sympathizers. Frank took part in an infamous raid in the town of Lawrence, Kansas, during which more than 150 men and boys were counted and numerous buildings destroyed. After the Civil War ended, the Bushwhackers were disbanded. Some historians believe that Jesse never really gave up fighting the war, though. He merely transferred his fury to a life of crime. Jesse and Frank staged the first daylight bank robbery in U.S. history, and over the next couple of years, the James brothers became suspects in several bank robberies. At first, the James gang kept a low profile by only robbing a couple banks a year and sometimes refusing to take any money or valuables from Southerners. And then the James gang got into the train robbery game, which brought some extra attention from the feds who offered a reward for the James brother capture. The Pinkerton Detective Agency was employed to bring the James Gang to justice, but the James Gang was able to elude them. Jesse James befriended a pro-Confederate newspaper editor in Missouri, and this editor went on to promote Jesse James as a hero and modern-day Robin Hood, who would steal from the rich to give to the poor. Although there has been no evidence that the James brothers ever gave any money to the poor, in reality, they preyed as much upon the common folk as they did the very rich, and also got rid of any innocents that were unlucky enough to get caught in the middle. Jesse and Frank James, along with a few other bandits, were defeated trying to rob the First National Bank of Northfield, Minnesota. During the attempted robbery, the townspeople heard about the holdup at the bank and started a shootout with the gang members. Two bandits were shot to death by townsfolk, and the rest of the outlaws fled the scene. The James brothers lay low for the next few years under assumed names. However, Jesse wanted to embark on a fresh crime spree and recruited some new outlaws. 
One of the new recruits conspired to kill Jesse James to collect the reward money. So instead of going out in a guns blazing shootout, the legendary Jesse James was shot in the back of the head while he was dusting a picture on the wall at the age of 34. Jesse went down in history for his full life and his wild end. Frank may have suffered the same fate, but Frank didn't love the attention as much as Jesse did. Frank ended up turning himself in a few months after his brother was murdered. However, prosecutors were unable to convince jurors that Frank was a criminal and Frank was eventually declared a free man. Frank went on to live an honest and peaceful life and passed away at age 72. Trying to guess Jesse and Frank's total count is near impossible because they were a very large group of guerrillas and there was a lot of fighting at the time due to the Civil War. But this number may have been as high as 180. The James brothers were also suspected in a few other incidents, but nothing was confirmed. Coming in at the number one spot is an outlaw unlike any of the others on this list, Black Bart. Black Bart had some interesting personality traits and fears for an Old West outlaw and gets the number one spot on this list for his creativity and colorful personality. He was known as a gentleman outlaw, even though he was one of the most notorious stagecoach robbers around the California area. Black Bart wasn't African American like his name might suggest, nor was his real name Bart. The name Black Bart may have come from a cowboy and outlaw story that was published in newspapers in the early 1870s called The Case of Summerfield. The story's villain was a man named Black Bart who had long unkempt hair, wore a long black coat, and had a habit of holding up Wells Fargo stagecoaches. Remember this as this is significant. Black Bart grew up on a farm in New York, but when he was older, he raced to California to strike it rich in the gold rush, abandoning his wife and children. He was writing letters back to his wife, but the last letter he wrote to her mentioned a run-in with Wells Fargo agents that had gotten him angry, and he had vowed revenge against Wells Fargo. It is unclear what exactly happened to set him on this path of revenge. He acted like a gentleman, but looked fearsome. He let his hair grow long and wild, wore a long black coat, and spoke in a deep menacing voice, just like the villain that he might have named himself after. To hide his identity, Black Bart wore a flour sack over his head with holes cut out for the eyes. Black Bart was also very polite, didn't curse, and didn't like guns. Bart went on to rob a total of 28 Wells Fargo stagecoaches and reportedly never shot a gun during any of his robberies. Black Bart was also afraid of horses. Most outlaws during this time did everything on horseback, including getting away. But Black Bart did everything on foot. His first stagecoach heist, he bluffed his way through the whole thing. He stopped the coach in a secluded spot and in a deep voice, he firmly but nicely asked the driver to hand over the strong box that was full of cash. Black Bart didn't hold out a gun, but shouted over his shoulder for his men to give him a solid volley if the driver tried to shoot him. The driver had looked out into the surrounding brush and saw several rifle barrels pointed right at him. After Black Bart made off with the loot, the driver noticed that the rifle barrels still didn't move. After investigating, the driver found that Black Bart had been working alone the whole time and the rifles were sticks that were propped up. Black Bart was also a poet and wrote cowboy poetry. He actually left two poems behind at two of his Wells Fargo stagecoach robberies. The first one, he did break his no swearing rule and it read, I've labored long and hard for bread, for honor and from riches, but on my corns too long you've tread, you fine hired sons of. The second one said, here I lay me down to sleep to wait the coming morrow, perhaps success, perhaps defeat, an everlasting sorrow. Let come what will, I'll try it on, my condition can't be worse, and if there's money in that box, Tis money in my purse. 
Blackbart was eventually caught in his final stagecoach robbery. The driver had just stopped to let a man off who hoped to do some hunting along a path while the stagecoach took the long way around the hill. The man had intended to catch back up to the stagecoach at the river, but when he arrived, he witnessed Black Bart holding up the coach. The man fired at Black Bart, striking him in the hand as he fled. The blood trail was followed and a bloody handkerchief with a laundry mark on it was found. The case was handed over to a detective who eventually found the laundry that the laundry mark belonged to. The detective learned that the handkerchief belonged to a regular customer who lived in a boarding house nearby. Surprisingly, Wells Fargo only pressed charges against Black Bart for his last stagecoach robbery, not the other 27 previous ones. He was sentenced to six years in prison, but got out after four years for good behavior. Afterwards, he wasn't heard from again. Some people believe that he may have moved to Japan and others believe that he may have remained in California working as a pharmacist under a different name. And that wraps up our list of the top five Wild West Outlaws. Make sure you drop a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and I will see you all later. The case was handed over to a detective who eventually found the laundry mark that... Hi. Come here, come snuggle with me. Can we snuggle? Just snuggle. Not, not without the ball. Yeah, take the ball. Take the ball. Take the ball. Just snuggle. El Paso passed in... When the town of a... When the town known as the Bushwhackers and Jesse, thank you. Oh, no more, no more. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You coming back? Okay, yeah, yeah, we're coming back. What does puppy want?